Uh, my name is John Caritas. I'm the Communications Director for the Acton Institute. And I'd like to welcome you to the Acton Lecture Series. Uh, we're in for another good one today. Um, today, Mr. Jordan Baller of the Acton Institute is going to be talking about ecumenical ethics and economics, a critical appraisal. So um, almost all of us, uh, especially those who are uh, Christians, um, either have belong to churches uh, who are uh, members of ecumenical groups or observers, many of us, and so uh, I think you'll find this a really fascinating subject. Now, it's uh, customary that we begin these uh, lectures with uh, an invocation, a prayer, so I uh, selected one that I thought would be suitable for the topic today, so let us pray. God bless the President of the United States and its people with peace and prosperity. God keep this peace and prosperity forevermore, forevermore, forevermore. Amen. Now that was a prayer that uh, was used in 1920 by a Syrian Orthodox priest here in the United States. It's not the type of prayer you'd likely encounter at ecumenical gatherings these days. Um, which tend to be uh, a little less uh, enthusiastic about the United States. For example, here's a, um, a prayer circle calendar, which is kind of typical what you hear, and this is, uh, begins with a bit of gospel uh, from John 21, and then there's the gloss. Quote, Around the world, policies of free trade and privatization have threatened the livelihood of many families at the very basic level. Families who no longer have land to farm may long, no longer have food to eat or may have to glean their food from the fields of another. Families where jobs have been lost or downsized struggle to live on the limited incomes and often must choose between food and other necessities. Let us lift up these families in our prayers, celebrating their courage and perseverance let us pray for the hungry, on and on. Now, so in fact, uh, it's part uh, of the um, policy positions of these ecumenical groups that the United States is really at the root of many of these globalization uh, problems that are that are linked to globalization. And in fact, uh, the most recent president uh, or general secretary of the World Council of Churchill's Churches actually blames some of the problems associated with religious fundamentalism on economic globalization. So um, there's a lot to get into here. Jordan is uh, uh, just published a new book, which you have on your uh, tables there. That is a gift from Acton. Take this with you. It's an excellent read, and it's an excellent summary of uh, what's going on with the public policy positions of ecumenical groups today. So. With that, I'd like to ask Jordan to come up and um, give us his talk on ecumenical ethics and economics. Thanks, John. Okay. Well, let me thank everybody for coming here today. That was an excellent introduction, John. Thank you very much. I want to begin by pointing out why it's important to talk about these matters right now in 2010. This year marks a number of important events in the larger institutional ecumenical movement. Indeed, there are at least four major landmarks in the ecumenical landscape for the year 2010. First, this year marks the 100th anniversary of the 1910 Edinburgh World Missionary Conference. The 2010 centenary celebration held last month was intentionally distinct from the 1910 conference in a number of ways, including the inclusion of, quote, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, Pentecostal, and independent churches. A second event to be held later this year is also worthy of note. The third Lausanne Congress on World Evangelization will be held in Cape Town in October. The Lausanne Congress, now officially affiliated with the World Evangelical Alliance, Quote, will bring together 4,000 leaders from more than 200 countries 
to confront the critical issues of our time, other world faiths, poverty, HIV and AIDS, persecution, among others, as they relate to the future of the church and world evangelization. Edinburgh and Lausanne form bookends around two other ecumenical events this year, however, and it is on the organizations related to these events that we will spend the bulk of our time here today. Last month, the World Communion of Reformed Churches held its Uniting General Council on the campus of Calvin College here in Grand Rapids. The WCRC is the result of a union between two other Reformed ecumenical groups, the World Alliance of Reformed Churches and the Reformed Ecumenical Council. We'll discuss this event in more detail in a bit, but beginning next week, the Lutheran World Federation, the mainline Lutheran global ecumenical body, is holding its 11th General Assembly in Stuttgart, Germany. So there are these four significant ecumenical gatherings happening in 2010, and we'll focus especially on the WCRC and LWF today. My own interest in the ecumenical movement largely comes out of my faith journey. I've been a member of non-denominational churches of Christ, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, and now the Christian Reformed Church. Additional concern about things ecumenical has been spurred by my interest in the theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who himself was deeply engaged in ecumenical work. It was through Bonhoeffer that I was first introduced to the contemporary usage of the term status confessionis, a Latin phrase that indicates a situation in which the gospel itself is at stake, in which a clear yes or a clear no on a particular issue or question places you either inside or outside the church, either for Christ or against him. It was in 2004 when I heard this phrase invoked by the ecumenical movement, this time not in the context of the German church struggle of the 1930s, but in the context of economic globalization. This latter usage of the concept of the status confessionis manifested itself in the Accra Confession, a text adopted by the World Alliance of Reformed Churches at its 2004 General Council. But since so few of us in this room even know this much about the World Alliance of Reformed Churches, also known by the rather unfortunate acronym WARC, <laughs> a few words of introduction are in order. By the phrase mainline ecumenical movement, I mean to indicate the largest and oldest, generally, apart from the WCRC, of the global ecumenical organizations, specifically the Lutheran World Federation, the World Council of Churches, and now the World Communion of Reformed Churches, the WCRC. These groups are mainline not only because of their age and stature, but also because they tend to be made up of what, at least in the North American context, are known as mainline, as opposed to evangelical, confessional, or fundamentalist denominations. So for instance, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the ELCA, is a member of the Lutheran World Federation, but the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is not. The Presbyterian Church in the United States, the PCUSA, is a member of the World Alliance of Reformed Churches, but the Presbyterian Church in America is not. This is not a hard and fast rule, to be sure, but in general it holds true. As we've noted, some of these evangelical or confessional denominations have their own ecumenical groups. So for instance, the International Lutheran Council, the Lausanne Congress, and so on. In any case, I'll give a brief introduction to the three groups and then return to some of the things that they've said, <clears throat> specifically in the most recent decade. The Lutheran World Federation was founded in Lund, Sweden in 1947 and now consists of 140 member churches in 79 countries. These member churches have a total membership of over 70 million. The World Communion of Reformed Churches, whose first uniting general council, as I said, was held here last month in Grand Rapids, consists of 227 member churches in 108 countries, whose membership exceeds 80 million. And the World Council of Churches, the godmother church of the ecumenical movement, whose institutional origins go far back into the last century, is made up of 349 member churches in more than 110 countries nationwide, worldwide, representing over 560 million Christians. A cautionary note is in order here about some of these numbers. I've been careful to say that the membership of these ecumenical groups is made up of member churches, which themselves have individual members. It is not on that basis, I don't think, acceptable or genuine to say that the WCC itself, for instance, represents 560 million Christians. It does not even though it is a mark of these ecumenical groups that they often claim to be the institutional voice of these millions of members. Uh, 
It is an open question to what extent and in what cases the various levels of authority that exist within these ecumenical groups actually do or do not represent their member denominations to say nothing of those denominations' members themselves. But these kinds of grandiose claims are part and parcel of the contemporary mainline ecumenical movement, and they're part of the characteristic developments in these groups over the last 50 years. The title of this lecture links the ecumenical movement's ethical witness and economics, but it's worth pausing to consider briefly where the critique of this particular linkage fits. The basic historical development of the ecumenical movement and its social witness has been toward an increasingly narrow and ideological character over the last 50 years. From the beginning, the ecumenical movement has had its critics, both friendly and hostile, both within and without. So to locate my own critique of the contemporary ecumenical movement, we must take a look at those critiques that have come before, indeed those upon which my own is founded and largely dependent. As I outline in more detail in my book, Ecumenical Babble, there are three basic levels of critique, the ecclesiastical, the ethical, and the economic. And these three levels are represented in this survey by three individuals. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Paul Ramsey, and Ernest W. Lefebvre. There's a certain historical progression here, as I have noted, and these three men represent successive generations of criticism leveled against the ecumenical movement. First, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the ecclesiastical critique. Bonhoeffer, the German theologian who died at the hands of, Nazi, of the Nazis in 1945, just weeks before the conclusion of World War II, is well known for his courageous resistance and especially for his works, Discipleship and Life Together. But perhaps not so well known is his deep involvement with the ecumenical movement, particularly as related to the German church struggle, the fight for control of the German churches and their centralization under the Nazi Reich. Among many of Bonhoeffer's works concerning the ecumenical movement, his 1935 essay, The Confessing Church and the Ecumenical Movement, stands apart as representing what I call the ecclesiastical line of critique. His question, quote, is the ecumenical movement in its visible representation a church? Here you have a basic yes or no question. Is it a church or isn't it? Either the ecumenical movement is a church in its institutional form or it is not. This is the basic question that must continually be asked of the ecumenical movement. For as Bonhoeffer notes, this question, are you church or aren't you? is the, quote, question of the authority with which the ecumenical movement speaks and acts. If it is an institutional form of the church, it has certain responsibilities and restrictions. There are things it must and must not do. It must behave like the church. If it isn't the church, then it is, in Bonhoeffer's words, quote, an association of Christian men and of whom each was rooted in his own church and who now assemble either for common tactical and practical action or for unauthoritative theological conversation with one another. The authority of such a group would be directly dependent on the particular expertise of those making the pronouncements. Simply being a Christian doesn't qualify you to make binding ethical judgments on political, ethical, or economic matters, for instance. And wearing a collar doesn't allow you to make binding pronouncements that fall beyond the purview of the gospel mandate. So this is the first line of critique. Bonhoeffer's yes or no question, are you church or aren't you? The first, broadest, and most basic level of critique, what I call, call the ecclesiastical level. Decades later, Paul Ramsey's critique would build upon and sharpen Bonhoeffer's basic question. In 1967, the Princeton ethicist Paul Ramsey wrote a little book called Who Speaks for the Church? A critique of the 1966 Geneva Conference on Church and Society. Ramsey's point of departure is the 1966 meeting of the World Council of Churches in Geneva, and where Bonhoeffer had asked whether or not the ecumenical movement was church, Ramsey asks why this church is not behaving like the church. This is the ethical level of critique, a narrowing of Bonhoeffer's critique to a more specific point. For Ramsey, the ecumenical movement clearly claims the authority and status of the church as institution. But all too often, it acts like merely a voluntary association or a political advocacy group rather than the Church of Jesus Christ. Ramsey calls this proclivity the social action curia and the church and society syndrome, by which he means to describe, quote, the passion for numerous particular pronouncements on policy questions 
to the consequent neglect of basic decision and action-oriented principles of ethical and political analysis. One of the things the church does in its institutional form is provide general ethical guidelines and principles to its members, nearly always leaving the application of those principles and guidelines to the conscience and calling of the individual members in their concrete situations. Ramsey's words written four decades ago ring true now as well, quote, of late, however, ecumenical social action pronouncements have presumed to encompass the prudence of churchmen in their capacities as citizens. It has been easier to arrive at specific recommendations and condemnations after inadequate deliberation than to penetrate to a deeper and deeper level the meaning of Christian responsibility, leaving to the conscience of individuals and groups of individuals both the task and the freedom to arrive at specific conclusions through untrammeled debate about particular social policies. In this way, Ramsey's critique is at the social ethical level, a criticism of how the church ought to behave in its ethical pronouncements and engagement in the public square. On to the third level. Over the next two decades following Ramsey, Ernest W. Lefebvre, the founder of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, would take up the Bonhoeffer-Ramsey line of engagement with the ecumenical movement and further sharpen the critique. In two volumes, the first in 1979 titled Amsterdam to Nairobi, and the second in 1987, Nairobi to Vancouver, Lefebvre would restate and reiterate the ecclesiastical critique of Bonhoeffer and the ethical critique of Ramsey, adding to it an economic critique of the specific positions taken by the ecumenical movement. This represents the third and narrowest level of critique. At this level, the criticism is not only that the ecumenical movement is not the church, or that it isn't acting like the church, but rather that it is mistaken in the content of its specific pronouncements. It's not just that the ecumenical movement is taking sides on issues that it shouldn't be, but indeed that it is taking the wrong side. Lefebvre identifies this as the greatest danger of this kind of ethical mistake. Quote, it is dangerous for any Christian body to identify itself fully with any specific political cause or order whether the prevailing one or a challenge to it. In identifying with a secular power or agency, the church runs the risk of losing its critical distance and of subverting its prophetic function, its capacity to judge all movements and systems by universal Christian standards. And thus, it is here that the question of economic ideology has become central to the ongoing critique of the ecumenical movement from Bonhoeffer in 1935 to Lefebvre, finally in 1987. My own work in this area has, as I've said, built upon this line of critique, updating it and applying it to the contemporary situation. Perhaps the greatest difference between where Lefebvre's critique leaves off and mine begins is in the institutionalization, rationalization, understood loosely, professionalization of the ecumenical economic ideology. What Ramsey calls the social action curia, or the church and society syndrome, and Lefebvre calls the social action establishment, has become what I call the ecumenical industrial complex. The combination of engagement and political advocacy on a scale only made possible by the advent of new technologies and media. And in examining what has been said in the last decade, for instance, we will find unanimity of purpose and message across the various ecumenical organizations, allowing us to speak accurately of the ecumenical movement as comprised of the LWF, WCRC, and WCC. Let us turn now to some specific pronouncements to see whether and to what extent the Bonhoeffer, Ramsey, Lefebvre, Baller line of critique applies to the contemporary ecumenical movement. In ecumenical babble, I was careful to look especially and particularly at those texts and statements that come from the highest levels of authority among the various groups. It is a feature of these institutions that they have various levels of authority, various representatives, and various events, which may or may not have real authority within the institution. As is typical, the radical nature of some of the more unauthoritative proceedings are often toned down or muted for more public consumption in more authoritative decrees and yet they remain important interpretive contexts. 
The highest level of authority in the LWF is the Assembly, which usually meets every seven years and last met in 2003. The 11th Assembly, as I've said, will be held later this month in Stuttgart in about two weeks. The 2003 Assembly issued statements specifically addressing the question of economic globalization according to the, quote, neoliberal paradigm. A message adopted by the 2003 Assembly describes the, quote, false ideology of neoliberal globalization as being, quote, grounded on the assumption that the market built on private property, unrestrained competition, and the centrality of contracts is the absolute law governing human life, society, and the natural environment. The statement goes on to address specific features of economic globalization, including mobility across borders, deregulation, corporate power, privatization, the commodification of life, homogenization of culture, speculative investment, and loss of sovereignty by nations. Here we have at the highest levels of the LWF specific condemnations of such public policy matters as genetically modified organisms and the privatization of public services. The villains in this paradigm are elements of a complex network of first world governments, headed by the United States, multinational corporations, and global governance and financial institutions. The picture is largely the same when we come to the Accra Confession, a product as we have seen of the 24th General Council of the World Alliance of Reformed Churches, so named because it was held in Accra, Ghana in 2004. This document is the result of a progress toward confession, a processus confessionis, also called in the larger ecumenical movement the Covenanting for Justice program, which we'll talk about more in a minute. A movement toward confession that is characterized by the following, quote, it is our painful conclusion that the African reality of poverty caused by an unjust economic world order has gone beyond an ethical problem and has become a theological one. It now constitutes a status confessionis. The gospel to the poor is at stake in the very mechanism of the global economy today. The problem of economic globalization now is claimed to constitute an article of the Christian, or at least the Reformed Christian faith. As the Accra Confession states, quote, the integrity of our faith is at stake if we remain silent or refuse to act in the face of the current system of neoliberal economic globalization. In another catalog of the sins of globalization, the Accra Confession includes, one, increasing concentration of wealth in the hands of the few, Two, corresponding poverty resulting in widespread death. Three, increasing burden of debt among poor nations. Four, the pursuit of, quote, resource-driven wars. Five, death as a result of preventable diseases. The effects of, quote, unlimited growth among industrialized countries and the drive for profit of transnational corporations also include serious environmental consequences, including one, species and habitat loss, two, climate change, three, quote, high levels of radioactivity, and four, the creation and patenting of genetically modified organisms. The specific tenets of globalization, excuse me, that are to be rejected are unrestrained competition, consumerism, and the unlimited economic growth and accumulation of wealth is the best for the whole world. Two, the other tenet that's rejected, the ownership of private property has no social obligation. Three, capital speculation, speculation, liberalization, and deregulation of the market, privatization of public utilities and national resources, unrestricted access for foreign investments and imports, lower taxes, and the unrestricted movement of capital will achieve wealth for all. And four, social obligations, protection of the poor and weak, trade unions, and relationships between people are subordinate to the processes of economic growth and capital accumulation. This is what's rejected. In the Accra Confession, we see clearly the elevation of a specific ideological and economic narrative to the status of an article of the Reformed and more broadly Christian faith. Now, a word is necessary here about the status of the Accra Confession given the formation of a new Reformed ecumenical body last month as I said, the World Communion of Reformed Churches. The Accra Confession figured prominently in the proceedings. And this is not surprising given the emphasis leading up to the conference. The clear message leading up to the Uniting General Council was that the WCRC in general, and this council in particular, would be primarily concerned 
with economic and environmental justice, narrowly construed, of course, along the ideological lines represented in the ACRA statement. Given the prominence of the scheduled discussions of the document, as well as the continued emphasis on the confession from the WCRC leadership, it is safe to assume that the economic narrative contained in the ACRA confession will form the basis of the new organization's definitive commitment to justice. The most recent meeting of the World Council of Churches General Assembly, the ninth in its history, was held in 2006 in Porto Alegre, Brazil. Sorry, thank you. This assembly included a report from the Public Issues Committee that was adopted by the assembly itself. This report continues the same basic perspective as we have seen in the LWF and now the WARC, uh, WCRC statements, addressing the question of poverty in sections on Latin America, reforming the United Nations, and water for life. Rather than outlining all of the claims in each of these sections, I'll save you that, I'll simply highlight the relationship between the WCC and the UN as it appears in this report. This relationship, as understood from the perspective of the WCC, underscores what I have called the ecumenical industrial complex, the preoccupation of ecumenical groups with public, political advocacy, and levering, leveraging political influence. The report states, for instance, that, quote, the churches, together with the wider civil society, carry a responsibility to shape the public opinion and to generate the political will for multilateral cooperative action that is needed for the UN to succeed in its mission. The WCC is thus not simply a prophetic voice calling governments, including the UN presumably, to account, but in the case of the United Nations specifically functions as an advocate and apologist for UN policy, specifically including the Millennium Development Goals. Accompanying the Public Issues Committee report and more clearly and succinctly representing the ecumenical movement's attitude toward economic globalization is the document Agape, Alternative Globalization Addressing Peoples and Earth, which has been the focus of numerous follow-up consultations across the world. The Agape background document is a 60-plus page condemnation of globalization and its various forms and consequences, including trade, finance, and ecological concerns. The 2006 assembly adopted and reaffirmed the agape perspective in a kind of liturgical call and response. The adoptive liturgy concludes with the platform of the agape call. Poverty eradication, trade, finance, sustainable use of the land and natural resources, public goods and services, life-giving agriculture, decent jobs, emancipated work and people's livelihoods, churches, and the power of empire headed by the United States. This is a graph you can get off of their website, the Agape process. Included in it is the, the Accra Confession. This is not just things that the WCC is doing, but it explicitly views itself as a uniting um, all three of the institutions I've discussed so far. So what must be said in response to this ecumenical worldview? First, we must say that the evidence of which this is only a thin sampling, supports the thesis that there is a whole cloth economic narrative of neo-Marxist ideology, liberation theology, spread over the entire ecumenical movement. And with the declarations and increasingly strident attitudes expressed at ecumenical gatherings, the ecumenical movement has reached and perhaps passed a tipping point. In this way, the mainline ecumenical movement, as the mainline denominations which largely make up the movement, is at a crossroads. This is a graph for some of those of you in the back who can't see the 10-year change in membership from 1994 to 2004 among mainline denominations in the United States. Just as mainline denominations in North America are facing declines in membership and contributions, the ecumenical movement faces similar challenges. Thus, an ENI correspondent, Ecumenical News International, they have a news service. Correspondent Stephen Brown writes in September of 2009 an article titled WCC told of, quote, serious concern about drop in contributions. Now given the fact that the ecumenical movement has been for more than the last 10 years undermining the very basis of the creation of wealth upon which it depends for its livelihood, such a development should not be perhaps all that surprising. It was indeed another hope expressed by the newly elected WCC president at the formation of the WCRC last month that the new group might be able to help spearhead a movement toward embracing evangelicals. 
This kind of evangelical engagement in the mainline ecumenical movement is unlikely to happen, however, as long as the ecumenical bureaucracy continues to embrace this economistic and divisive ideology, pitting first world against third, rich against poor, oppressor against oppressed. Indeed, as we have noted, the pervasive economic ideology of the ecumenical movement, we should be moved, I believe, to mournful hope and certainly not to triumphalistic celebration at the movement's shortcomings. Just as there are renewal movements of various sorts within mainline denominations today, there ought to be renewal movements among and within the various mainline ecumenical groups. Those of us who are members of denominations that belong to these groups, or those of us who know those who are members of such groups, must work for reform. If the reformers of the 16th century thought that the medieval church was capable of reform, who are we to judge the ecumenical movement to be beyond help? It is here critical, I believe, to avoid any kind of worldly criticism or triumphalism, cynicism or triumphalism. The spirit moves where the spirit wills. Our duty is thus to pray for revival and reform. Thus it must be our fervent hope and prayer that updating and applying the critiques of Bonhoeffer, Ramsey, and Lefebvre to the contemporary situation will have positive effects on the future development of the ecumenical movement's social witness. There are many possible solutions to the various facets of the line of critique articulated here. At each level of the critique, from Bonhoeffer to Ramsey to Lefebvre, there is the real potential for correction of the defects in the ecumenical movement's social witness. First, at the, at the ecclesiastical level, where Bonhoeffer's question is most pointedly at issue, the ecumenical movement might simply abandon claims to being an institutional form of the church, acknowledging itself to simply be a kind of advocacy group or lobbying organization. This is highly unlikely, however, and would undermine the privileged status of the ecumenical movement altogether. More promising is that the ecumenical movement take its responsibility as church more seriously, making its pronouncements far more circumspect and prudent. This would mean, secondly, at the ethical level, where Ramsey's critique applies, the ecumenical movement would embrace this distinction between the institutional role of the church as a social witness and the political advocacy and social work of its members as the church manifests itself organically in society. The ecumenical movement might well, therefore, decline to issue doctrinaire and casuistical proclamations about this or that particular policy. Instead, the ecumenical movement would understand its role in this sphere to provide broad guidance rather than particular judgments. By outlining the broad parameters of, access, of, of acceptable Christian ethical and even economic thinking, for instance, the ecumenical movement's social witness would fiercely protect, quote, room for legitimate disagreement among Christians and among other people, as well as in the public domain, which disagreement ought to be welcomed and not led one way towards specific conclusion, thus Ramsey. This kind of reform of the ecumenical movement's social witness would place correspondingly less emphasis on direct political engagement and advice, as offered, for instance, to the United Nations, and correspondingly greater emphasis on providing moral guidance to the church. The character of ecumenical statements on social issues under this kind of solution would be far more restrained and chastened than we find today. But barring these reforms, there is still a third possibility, that, specifically, that one specifically pursued by Lefebvre's critique, for the ecumenical movement to correct its understanding of economic globalization and to abandon its ideological neo-Marxist narrative. It would be no less wrong, I believe, to make adherence to a neoliberal ideological view as a matter of confessional integrity. But at least the major flaws of the revolutionary worldview of the ecumenical social witness could be, to one extent or another, mitigated. As Lefebvre writes, quote, taking sides and not taking sides both have moral and political pitfalls. But supporting the wrong side is the worst of all options. A richer dialogue and a constructive program of engagement with the market economic theory might be undertaken by the ecumenical movement if it would leave off its attempts to turn the neo-Marxist narrative into a confessional absolute. In this sense, writes Lefebvre, quote, ecumenical leaders should make fuller use of the research and analysis of social, political, and economic issues generated by universities and public policy research centers, including the Acton Institute. 
The point here, however, is not to subsume the sovereignty and authority of the ecumenical social witness to economic or political experts of whatever ideological persuasion, but it's just simply to take them, their witness into account. So rather, as Ramsey puts it, quote, the aim of these procedures and deliberations should not be to improve the church's speaking to the world, its supposedly expert scientific advice, but to make sure that in everything addressed to the churches and to the world today, our church councils can better speak for the church, for the whole of the Christian truth, and every saving word, but no more than can be said upon this basis. In this way, writes Lefebvre, the rich body of Christian social teaching needs to be studied, refined, and updated in the light of the findings of modern social and natural sciences. But the scientific findings themselves do not determine the proper course of ethical decision making. Therefore, Lefebvre agrees with Ramsey that, quote, the primary obligation of the WCC in the political realm is to speak to its member churches, not for them. Council and denominational leaders should seek to clarify political and social issues in light of the Christian ethic and to motivate individuals to be responsible citizens. This is by far the most important task. WCC pronouncements should be more like papal encyclicals which instruct the faith, faithful and basic moral precepts and relate those precepts to current realities, thus Lefebvre. It is in establishing those current realities that the findings of modern science play an important role. But in and of themselves, these findings do not determine the content of Christian ethical thought. This has all too often been the case, however, in the ecumenical movement's embrace of the basically economistic neo-Marxist worldview. In this regard, Lefebvre is right to point to Roman Catholic social teaching's valuation of the concept of prudence as instructive for the Protestant social witness. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. But without pursuing correctives along these general lines, the answer to the ethicist James Gustafson's question, who listens to the moral teachings of Protestant churches, will continue to be indeterminate, and deservedly so. Without doing the hard work of serious ethical deliberation that engages a variety of conflicting perspectives. The ecumenical movement has little claim to possess authentic moral authority in the public square or among the churches. The specific distinctions that follow here in conclusion are intended to highlight some of the ways in which reform might profitably be undertaken by the ecumenical movement in service to the entire church. But in order for this to realistically take place, serious changes will need to be made to the ecumenical groups themselves along the lines of what I just said. Most importantly, I believe, they must adopt an attitude of humility and service rather than of authority and influence. This would ideally result in less political opportunism and media ma maneuvering. And just one example, following the earthquake in 2005 and the resulting tsunami in the Indian Ocean, officials from the WCC and LWF were the f among the first to blame the United States and other nations that hadn't signed the Kyoto Protocol for the extent of the damage. I'll conclude in what I hope is proper ecumenical fashion by acknowledging that we are not all of the Protestant or Orthodox persuasion here today, and still others are not directly involved by our church affiliation in any of the groups we've mentioned here. But on a broader ecumenical level, I want to point out two things that the ecumenical movement, as I've described it here today, can learn from Roman Catholic social thought. First, the realm of prudence versus moral principles or absolute judgments. We find this distinction throughout the corpus of Roman Catholic social thought. As Lefebvre observes rightly, WCC pronouncements should be more like papal encyclicals, which instruct the faithful and basic moral precepts and relate those precepts to current realities. Let me point out an example of how this prudence versus principle distinction plays out in Protestant social ethics. A key complementary distinction to be observed here, as we have seen, is between the church as an institution and the church as an organism. This is a hallmark of reformed ecclesiological thought, but it is one that is all too often rejected by Christian social activists. An essay by Calvin Van Rieken, a professor of moral theology at Calvin's Theological Seminary, makes a distinction that corresponds to the institution-organism distinction. That is the distinction between kingdom work and church work. The former is what every Christian does as a matter of course in life in the various facets of his or her individual calling. As Van Rieken puts it, part of our responsibility as Christians is to exercise our compassion and love for others in tangible ways. Christians should feed the hungry, comfort the sorrowing, and visit the sick. As part of their kingdom service, Christian plumbers plumb since there will not be any leaks in the kingdom. <laughs> 
In kingdom service, Christian teachers teach in the sure hope that while now we see darkly, one day we will see face to face. And in that day, there won't be any ignorance. As kingdom workers, Christian truckers truck. Because in the kingdom, the good things God has created need to be distributed far and wide. By contrast, church work is the work that should be done by the church as an institution. And the institutional role of the church in society is as follows, quote, the primary work of the institutional church is to open and close the kingdom of God and to nurture the Christian faith. This it does primarily through the pure preaching of the gospel, the pure administration of the sacraments, and the exercise of church discipline. Secondarily, however, on social questions, quote, there are times during which the institutional church must speak out about social injustices. The institutional church should articulate in broad terms the proper goals that social policy should promote. This is far different from making specific policy proposals or judgment. For, quote, normally the church should not take it upon itself to entertain the political question of how a particular society can best achieve this goal. The church as an institution doesn't have any special expertise or insight into these kinds of prudential questions. But why are these distinctions between the church's institution and organism, between church and kingdom work, so important? because they help us see that when the church does speak institutionally, it's a matter of grave moral weight and seriousness. As Van Rieken puts it, quote, on some occasions, the church should speak out against a particular social policy. It should do so when the policy is clearly immoral. And for him, that's a very important term, clearly immoral. A policy can be more immoral, either because the goal of the policy is evil, as in the case of ethnic cleansing, or because the policy is itself immoral, although the goal is morally desirable. Legalized abortion may be one way the government hopes to reduce poverty, a worthy intent, but the church ought to oppose abortion and speak out against it. And I should note, just uh, this past month, the CRC Synod also mandated uh, that its Office of Social Justice provide materials to address um, the question of abortion and oppose it as the church official teaching is. As of now, the Office of Social Justice does not have any materials related to uh, the, the, the question of abortion. The second thing that the ecumenical movement can learn from Roman Catholic social thought is the value and importance of an authentic and ongoing engagement with the Christian tradition. The problem of the current state of ecumenical social witness is that there is nothing definably characteristic from the statement of one ecumenical group to, the, to another. We find very little distinctively, quote, reformed or Lutheran in these kinds of pronouncements. And this, to me, is clear evidence that the conclusions are not based on drawing from the rich fount of theological heritage available to the various traditions. The LWF sprinkles in references to Luther. Luther wrote a lot of things. Wark refers to Calvin, but often only in the most trivial way. For instance, a Johannesburg statement on economic and environmental justice last September, a response to the Acre Confession, invokes Calvin in the following way. In John Calvin's theology, human life is set in relation to the life of God. This is rather thin theological gruel for the rich Reformed tradition to sustain itself upon. One might as easily said the Bible teaches this. But this kind of ornamentation is a basic, of a basically neo-Marxist ideology with traditional sources is standard procedure for ecumenical documents. As Lefebvre writes, what we have is the embrace of liberation theological heterodoxy as opposed to classical Christian orthodoxy. Thus writes Lefebvre, quote, the emergence of liberation theology bears out the observation of the late Pope Paul VI, noting the church's, quote, loss of confidence in the great masters of Christian thought. Paul said the vacuum has, quote, all too often been filled by a superficial and almost servile acceptance of the currently fashionable philosophies. In the same vein, Edward Norman, an Anglican priest who was a professor at Cambridge University at the time, said that Christianity today, quote, has, no, not the magazine, has increasingly borrowed its political outlook and vocabulary, the issues it regards as most urgently requiring attention, and even its tests of moral virtue from the progressive thinking of the surrounding secular culture. Well, maybe he was talking about the magazine. In terms of positive appropriation of the tradition, I would point reformed Christians to the doctrine of subsidiarity. This doctrine has itself become a principle of Roman Catholic social thought and is captured in essential definition, quote, 
A community of a higher order should not interfere in the internal life of a community of a lower order, depriving the latter of its functions, but rather should support it in case of need and help to coordinate its activity with the rest of society, always with a view to the common good. But this doctrine was also formed in a substantive ways by reformed and political and theological thinking in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. Here we can point to the whole scope of the history of federalism more generally, covenant theology, and subsidiarity as related to the Dutch jurist Johannes Althusius. The ideological confessionalism of the ecumenical movement illicitly elevates political or economic opinions to the level of an article of faith. For when it does attempt to address such political or economic specifics, as in the case of the Accra Confession, for instance, the church runs the risk of alienating, even anathematizing those who disagree. There are so many competitors for the Christian faith that we must always be wary of importing them into the church. The ecumenical movement's engagement of social questions, particularly on economic globalization, for the last decade and more has been a blatant and, in my view, indefensible politi politicization of the church's confession. And as such, it must be rejected as inconsistent with the church's ecumenical mandate and Christian conscience. Allow me to conclude with the concluding words of Ecumenical Babel, the book that you've been given today. It is the fervent hope expressed in this critique that the divisive and ideological language of economistic faith, all too often expressed by the social witness of the ecumenical movement, might be renewed and reformed. Let our Christian confession be not, I follow Marx, or I follow Hayek, I follow Rand, or I follow Keynes, but rather together we follow Christ as in 1 Corinthians 1.12. Ultimately, our hope for unity lies not in ourselves or in any feeble human efforts, but in the power and providence of God, quote, who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ, 2 Corinthians 1.26. That's conclusion. Thanks.